Greetings, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Kunet. I'm uh, a pilot for the uh, Forgotten Heroes Foundation that flies the yeah, Newport 17 and this uh, Fokker DR1, DR standing for Dreidecker, German <sighs> for triplane. Awesome. And uh, this airplane's colors and its appearance is probably the most iconic of World War One because everybody is uh, linking and associating it with the Red Baron, with uh, Baron uh, Manfred von Richthofen, the highest scoring ace pilot of uh, World War I. Now first a little bit about the airplane itself. Uh, why a triplane? Well, first of all, the British had one. So when, when the Germans got the first, captured the first triplane, they went to their best designer, Anthony Fokker, who, by the way, is a Dutchman. Uh, the British didn't want his designs. He asked the French, hey, you're interested in Fokker airplanes? They didn't, they didn't buy anything either. So he asked the Germans and they said, hey, yeah, go ahead, we buy stuff from you. So that's how he ended up working, in fact, for the Germans. The airplane has therefore been a response to the British uh, triplane, the Sopwith triplane. Um, the idea of a triplane is you have three wings, you make more lift, and the idea was that this airplane would outclimb anything else. So basically, there are several schools of thought in an, in an, in an area of uh, combat situation. You either outclimb your opponent or you outdive them, or you're outmaneuvering them. And so the triplane is extremely maneuverable um, and it climbs extremely well. It does, however, not make it away in a dive because the three wings have a lot more drag so an airplane like the Newport 17 in a dive would catch up with the Fokker. So if you're the pilot of a Fokker, you're not going into exchange uh, when, when the guy's behind you to go in a dive. You want to go up in a climb or you go into a turning dogfight where he can't, he can't turn as tight as, as you can. So this, this was the basic design philosophy uh, of this airplane. Just like the other one, uh, this one is a recreation. The, the construction method has been changed from, from wood to metal, uh, making it more predictable in, in, its, in its strength than, than wood. It uh, has also more modern engine on board. Another thing about the Fokker triplane, which makes it a milestone, is the fact not only was it more maneuverable and would outclimb anything else that was around at the time, it also has two machine guns. There was a major improvement because the machine guns back then frequently jammed and that really ruined the day because now you could neither attack nor even defend yourself. So having a, a spare machine gun, a second machine gun, certainly gave it a lot more firepower and more reliable firepower. So the most famous pilot of the Fokker triplane was Baron Manfred von Richthofen. Uh, he came from minor Prussian nobility. When I say minor, that means that we're all in that family. Have, they all had been serving for a couple of hundred years as military leaders, in other words, the generals and field marshals. So um, Manfred followed in the footsteps. Originally was a cavalry officer and realized very quickly that in that war, uh, horses didn't stand a chance anymore against machine guns and tanks. And besides, he saw airplanes flying over top and by chance, he got that opportunity to actually join the fledgling German Air Force and got trained first as observer and then as a pilot. Initially, he was not a great pilot. He had to really work on learning on the job. He was an extremely good marksman. And when finally, his piloting skills and the marksmanship all joined forces, he got an incredible record in, in uh, uh, shooting down his opponents. Now, the war back then was still a very honorable one. That was about to change at the time when he was uh, shot down. Uh, back then, for example, if a gun would jam, and you realize that as the pilot you hit the opponent in the in the gun sight, you would not do the fatal shoot. What's the fatal shoot? No, oh, you mean kill? The yeah, other yeah. guy could the kill there. Uh, right. Okay. You would not. You would not do that. So okay. that with with in, in 1917 about 
uh, that that fell by the wayside. Mm. Another thing too, very interesting at all at all sites, the higher ups believed that pilots who would have parachutes would rather prematurely abandon their aircraft, which is of course totally irresponsible and and in total disregard for human life because most pilot miles more than any anything else in that war worried about burning to death and everybody had their service revolver not in order to fight their way back home to, to, to uh, their own lines if they came down uh, over enemy lines rather to shoot themselves instead of burning to death. Wow. So yes, and, and uh, the, the British and French kept that, that philosophy all the way to the, to the end of the war. German pilots at least, and this is information, I, I didn't know that uh, either, but uh, written by Anthony Fokker himself in his 1931 book, which I happen to own. I just recently read that, and from 1917 onwards, not not all units, but quite a few uh, units uh, fitted their, their pilots out with parachutes. So, all right, this is the, the basic uh, setup about the airplane. When you look at it from behind, its biggest drawback you can see this already, there's the pilot hole. You can't see. You can't see out of the airplane. So oh. the middle wing blocks a hell of a lot of, of field of vision. When you're taxiing, you're totally blind. And worst of all, worst of all, when that when that tail comes down on rollout, that middle wing blocks all the airflow over the rudder. And so these airplanes had a terrible track record ground looping on rollout. Wow. Very high uh, operational um, accident rate for the same reason they have these little toga sticks that's these are little skids so when the ground loop starts and the airplane wants to roll over uh the little pogo skid this pogo stick skids would keep the airplane up right side up and prevent at least the worst i imagine do these ever break this is just wood yep they do, <laughs> okay. they do, they do. So we are, really, that is that is uh, most of it about the airplane. Manfred von Richthofen, uh, he got his score up in the end. I think it was around 80 or 85 uh, kills, and it was for the longest of times thought that uh, a Canadian Brown had actually uh, shot him down from his airplane, and it turned out that wasn't the case. It was actually during a dogfight at low altitude over enemy lines, that Australian uh, infantry, it was a single bullet from, from an infantry rifle that got Richthofen. He managed to still get the airplane on the ground and when the, the uh, soldiers ran up to the airplane, uh, he was dead in the cockpit. And uh, of course, everybody knew this airplane. Uh, it was Richthofen's flying circus. When uh, that when that Jagdstaffel, in other words, that squadron, they were all ordered to put on camouflage paint in 1916. And they were so upset about that because everybody was proud about their own personal track record and they all had decorated their airplanes individually. So they were all so upset about it, they found, they looked for the most ridiculous colors. and. These airplanes, they all looked like canary birds. <laughs> Blue and yellow, bright red, you know, and, it, and hence came about the name Richthofen's Flying Circus. That's how it came about, because it was a direct defiance of, of, the, of the headquarters order to now uh, camouflage all the airplanes, you know, so they couldn't be easily found on the ground and, and shot at. So, wow. anyway, that's, that pretty much is all that I have about this airplane. Awesome. Uh, now you mentioned that these planes—I mean, they're at least a hundred years old, right? They can't be—you can't really find them. You have to sort of rebuild. Well, these were built. These were built by a company that normally sells them as kits. Okay. And he had, as I said, he had transferred the construction from wood to metal. Um, which in the case of this airplane uh, involved a couple of changes. The original, when it was wood, didn't need any bracing wires. 
Oh. It was a fully self self uh, carrying cantilever wing. Now, mm. when he went with with metal spars, uh, it, it wasn't as strong, so it has like almost other uh, World War One airplanes. It has the bracing wires again, and that was another reason why this airplane was novel. It didn't need bracing wires, so if you got shot at. On any of the others, you, you hit a bracing wire, the whole structure oh. would collapse. If you don't have any bracing wires, and it basically each of those wings by having a, a hollow box spar that's very strong, uh, the wing itself had all the strength in the world. It didn't need these stupid wires. But mm. since the airplane has been reconfigured to metal construction, you have to put them back on it. Of course, nobody, I hope, is wow. going to this. <laughs> no, let's hold that. But well, thank you very much. That was that's a good bit of history. Oh.